Hi, I'm Angela Sharp, and welcome to The Daily Mix. I normally don't wear a blue shirt, obviously, when I host the show, but it kind of felt needed today. By now, I'm sure you heard we lost Bobby Plager last week. Bobby was a St. Louis fixture. He was an original blue, playing on the blues with his brothers Barkley and Bill. He was known for his hip check and more than a few pranks. Bobby not only made his mark with blues fans, but in the St. Louis community. As most of you know, I worked with the Blues for 11 seasons, and during those years, I talked with Bobby often. He always had a story or a joke to tell, sometimes a dirty joke. Okay, a lot of the times a dirty joke. <laughs> I interviewed him so many times, but he had so many stories to tell, you were never bored. He could bring tears to grown men's eyes, just like that, or make you laugh instantly. One of my absolute favorite interviews I ever did with him was just that. He goes from talking about having his number retired to beating up fans in the stands. It's been about a year since your number went high up into the rafters. Can you take us back through that moment for you, just being able to see your number go up there with, with some of the other greats? Well, you don't know how special that was that night for me. So special. And uh, the St. Louis Blues and the fans, they even made it more special here that night. And I didn't expect it uh, when number eight came down and met me halfway. Uh, to bring me up the rest of the way and he was my hero he's my brother so uh, it's that year very special it's still I get a little choked up thinking about it but I'm one lucky person and I've been blessed I remember talking to you right after that happened you said you were really surprised that the eight came down and and, and helped bring you up and I think there wasn't a dry eye in the house that night that I know that had to mean a lot to you because I think it meant a lot to everybody well, I've talked to a lot of people. Everybody's been here or they watched it on there and they're grown men. And they said, I'm a grown man. I never cry, but I cried that night. And I know I uh, had tears in my eyes and uh, very special. I mean, uh, if you haven't, uh, if you weren't here, the tape is out somewhere. Watch it. I watch it and I still get tears in my eyes. Absolutely. And we love that about you is that you can get emotional about things, but we got to go back in time. Uh, there was a time where you actually left the bench to go fight some fans, right? Well, I went up there, you know, when your coach is going off the ice and you're watching him going skating behind him, you see something happen to him, you better get up there and you better protect. He's the coach if you want to play. So, yeah, I was in Philadelphia, and the funny part was, if you see the picture, uh, I was the first one right up there. Right behind me was my brother, Bark, and right behind him was my brother, Billy. And, you know, Philadelphia was a city of brotherly love, so the Plager boys just went up and uh, gave him a little love. Give him a little of your own brotherly level. That's what we love about you. You can be emotional and you can go beat up some fans if we need you to, right? Right. I've been very blessed and I've had a lot of fun playing this game. All right. Well, I lo we love it. Everybody, let's make some noise for one of our favorites, Mr. Bobby Plager. The thing I think I'm going to miss most about Bobby is watching him interact with all the fans. Every community event we went on, there was a line of fans to see and meet Bobby. And he would sign anything and everything they brought him and take every photo they asked for. And I think that was apparent on Wednesday when he passed. As you looked through Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, it was just photos and photos and photos of people with Bobby. Now, if there was a fan, maybe a little shy, standing off in the corner, by the end of the day, them and Bobby were just best friends. That's just kind of the personality he had. He was friendly and he would bring his friendship to you. As much as he talked about how the crest on the front was more important than the name on the back, what was actually most important to him was his family. He bragged on his members of his family so often. In fact, I remember being in the concourse and he said, hold on, Ange, come here, Ange. And his grandson was there who called him coach, by the way, adorable, probably three years old. And he had him name off all the members of the Blues team and what numbers they were. It was actually pretty impressive. But at least there's one memory that we know that his family will have forever, and that is getting to see Bobby hold the Stanley Cup up and, of course, be in the Stanley Cup parade with him. STL TV was there. Take a look at that day. The man of the hour, Mr. Bobby Plager. Bobby, you wanted this back in the day, but it came a little later than you expected. Is it still just as good? This is great. It's a little late, but it's great. And what's going on here? And I always said, if we ever win a Stanley Cup, have a parade down market, it'll be the biggest St. Louis ever seen, and it is, and there'll never be one bigger. They definitely did not disappoint you. I know you got to drink out of it, you got to hold it up and everything. Did it kind of take you back to those days when you played? Oh, it takes you back. You know, we tried to get it a few times at 
the feeling to win it for these guys here, I keep telling you, you'll never know. It. It's the greatest. Well, I love it. You got all your family here. I want you to see this here. One, one second. He was so proud and showing off the different shirts that his daughter was wearing and introduced me again to all his family members. Definitely somebody we are going to miss having here in St. Louis. Number five in your program, but number one in your hearts. Rest in peace, Bobby. Let's get started with today's Daily Mix. I want you guys to stay tuned. A little bit later on in the show, I take you through the Science Center and the Mummies exhibit. Now, City Hall is one of St. Louis's most iconic buildings. And now, after more than a century, its historic beauty will shine brightly each and every night in downtown St. Louis. Last week, Mayor Krusen flipped the switch on our new exterior lighting on City Hall that was donated by the Gateway Foundation. To date, this project ranks among the most expensive and largest projects the Gateway Foundation has undertaken. Our cameras were there as the lights came on, so be sure to take a look at our social media and YouTube channel to watch the full event. Now, there's still high demand for the COVID-19 vaccine in the city of St. Louis, and the Department of Health is working hard to make sure any resident who wants the vaccine has a chance to get one. Just last week, they hosted two mega mass vaccination events and administered more than 6,000 shots at St. Louis Community College at Forest Park. If you're a St. Louis City resident and interested in getting a vaccination, you can learn more and sign up for notifications on future clinics at the city's website at stlouis-mo.org and just click on COVID-19 information at the top of the homepage. Once you have your vaccine, you can take your card and treat yourself to a free original glazed donut at Krispy Kreme. This is right. Anyone who shows their vaccination record card can get one free donut a day, every day for the rest of the year. I don't suggest you do that because I think if I had a donut every day for the rest of the year, I would gain like 45 pounds. But it is nice that they're offering you that, so that's very nice. But if you made the personal decision not to get the vaccine, don't worry, you can still get a free donut and a medium brewed coffee on Mondays through May 24th. So either way, you get a sweet treat, right? Now, the pandemic has had devastating effects on zoos and aquariums around the country, including our own St. Louis Zoo. This week, some of the greatest country artists of today will come together for a one-time virtual benefit concert. All Together for Animals is a worldwide live stream event being produced locally by Contemporary Productions. Proceeds from the concert will benefit the St. Louis Zoo and the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. All Together for Animals takes place this Wednesday, March 31st at 7 p.m. For tickets and more information, visit stlzoo.org slash concert. On Thursday, you can get out and enjoy some seltzer and spins at the St. Louis Union Station. Okay, this event sounds like it's gonna be so much fun. It's going to include a sampling of new Anheuser-Busch products, a tour of the historic train cars, a ride on the St. Louis wheel, and 18 holes of mini golf. They're a hosted cocktail events in the past at the aquarium, but this is the first time they're gonna be using the train cars and the wheel park, so it should be a ton of fun. Especially since Luau in the Lou is also going on now, Seltzers and Spins is this Thursday, April 1st. For tickets and more, go to stlouisunionstation.com. Drive-In St. Louis is now set to return to the Powerplex this summer. Last year, Forbes magazine named it one of the top five drive-ins in America. And this year promises to be even bigger and better. In the coming weeks, the 12 acre parking lot will be transformed and ready to host 25 weeks of concerts, movies, graduations, and special events. 
That's all gonna start in May. 70 event dates have already been planned and tickets are set to go on sale this Thursday at noon. You can find all the details and register for concert and movie updates and get tickets at driveinstl.com. And if you're interested in having your school have, you know, hosted your graduation at Drive In St. Louis, you can go to powerplexstl.com for more information. I kind of told you about it in the beginning of the show. The Science Center has a Mummies of the World exhibit going on right now, which was very interesting. I remember learning about mummies at school, but it's very different to kind of see them all right there. So I went to the Science Center, and of course, I'm gonna take you with me. I have a great adventure for you today. We're gonna go into the Mummies of the World exhibit right here at the St. Louis Science Center. I hear it's amazing. I can't wait to find out what it's all about and keep it up. So you ready? Let's go. This is gonna be so exciting. I caught up with Neville Crenshaw here the special exhibits manager here at the St. Louis Science Center, and we are in a very unique place. This is the what is this mummy exhibit called? Yeah, the mummies exhibition. It's called uh, mummies of uh, mummies of the world. The exhibition. We're going to be talking about mummies and mummification uh, across several different cultures, across several different time periods, from the familiar ancient Egypt uh, to some of those that are less familiar, even as uh, late as 1994. I mean, this is pretty exciting. So, can you kind of? Um let's say make this the elementary school version for me here. So when somebody first walks into this exhibit, what is it like? Uh, you're gonna be experiencing a, uh, a quick introduction on uh, mummification and uh, mummies themselves. We need to talk about it as a scientific process first, you know, to understand its uh, form of preservation. But uh, we also wanna talk about the fact that these are real people on display inside this exhibition who had, uh, who had lives, who had families and friends and whose uh, experience mattered. And that's what's important about this exhibition is you're gonna learn about cultures that you uh, can no longer go see, but we can experience through the mummies left behind. Wow, okay, so I mean, you kind of really span the globe, and I guess I just didn't realize how many different cultures use mummies in a way. Yeah, you know, a lot of them did it purposefully, like uh, the Inca, uh, Egyptians, that kind of thing. Some of them did it accidentally because of the dry or cold environments, or even just a steady wind stream can, can create a mummy in a perfectly uh, uh, set crypt. So I've seen a lot of families coming in here, you know, smaller kids, mom and dad, that kind of thing. What kind of things are you hearing from the people that have walked through? I think people are seeing that mummification is a lot bigger than they thought it was. It was a lot more common than uh, just the ancient Egyptians. It's a lot more varied than they thought it was. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that you can go about mummification, whether it be artificially or naturally. And I think people are coming away with a newfound respect for several different cultures that they may not have been familiar with. Now, we happen to be talking to you in the, the Burns collection, which when I first saw it, I was like, it's kind of scary. But now that I've been looking at it more, it's actually really interesting. So talk me through this one a little bit. Yeah, this one's unique. Uh, this was done by a Scottish anatomist uh, who was trying to find a way to make it easier for medical students to study anatomy. Um, we don't have any idea how he went about this process. It's kind of unique in that uh, these collections are the only places you can see mummies uh, that are preserved this way. Uh, they That's were... cool in itself that you don't even know really how he yeah. did it. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that they could tell some of the chemicals that he used, uh, but the timing and other different processes, we have no idea. So when you see it, it's a unique form of mummification. And uh, what's interesting is that they had used it for anatomical study because you don't want doctors just going in and operating on somebody based on what they know in textbooks. Uh, and cadavers were harder to find back then to study on, so this was a way of preserving them for uh, for those medical students. I mean, this is a, a really cool exhibit that is here at the St. Louis Science Center. How long is this going to be up and running? We're happy to have this till September 6th, which is a great long run. We'll have it throughout the summer, which is gonna be great. And uh, we hope everybody has a chance to come out and see it at some point. 
Is there anything that you think people should know and understand prior to their visit here? I would just say that, you know, some of the material inside is a little bit difficult for uh, children. And I would say that's a conversation for you and your family to have before coming in. Because we want to make sure that everybody who comes in here has a good experience. And we don't want anything to catch anybody off guard. We are talking about real mummies here. And these are real people uh, who are in various states of display. And uh, we want to make sure that uh, you understand that before coming in. Well, I appreciate that so much. And thank you for letting me take a look around here. Neville, thank you again. Right when you walk in, the very first thing, and it's something that I had a question about because finding out that these were all real people, I was curious if they had the same rights and rules that we do now about, you know, are you allowed to kind of show off my body? But they have their ethics statement right here, directly on the wall. And I was actually informed that everybody has given their rights in, in various ways, either from, like through family or through whoever, you know, currently owns that thing. So that is good to know. And I like how it's the first thing you see right you when you walk in. So you ready? Let's go explore. Uh, all these hieroglyphics here are either passages about the person or passages from the Book of the Dead that are spells. Uh, one of the ways that we know that it was a woman of high status is because, uh, and, and you might notice the beard, that was common for people to be depicted, even women with a beard. With so, the, oh, so I thought the beard common. meant, so that yeah. doesn't mean it's a guy. No, in fact, several uh, uh, um, uh, female pharaohs, I believe uh, Hatsafoot, uh, was depicted with a uh, beard as well. Uh, one of the cool things about this, though, is we know as a woman of high status because in ancient Egypt, real uh, wood that could be used for uh, uh, sarcophagus was incredibly expensive because they didn't have any. They had to buy it from Lebanon. So that was one of the ways you showed your wealth was by having this nice wooden coffin. Uh, these folks were found in a crypt in uh, Summersdorf Castle in Germany. Uh, these would have been from about the time of the Thirty Years' War. Uh, the Baron, as you can see, still has these well-preserved boots that were made specifically for his burial. Uh, these are here on display with permission of the family as they, they'd like to learn more about their history, so the study of them helps them understand their place in history. Very interesting, and it's amazing that those boots have last, lasted the test of time like this. Absolutely. Okay. So we've got two mummy bundles here, and these are kind of like your all-in-one tomb. Uh, it's going to have offerings for the deceased uh, to give them a good afterlife, and uh, very uh, intricately braided uh, rope bundles to contain them. So and yeah, what what is this right here in the middle? So th that is a mummy right there inside of that uh, bundle right there. This uh, particular priest is the priest of Nest Men. Nest just means of in a way, so it's he was the priest of men. Uh, oh, okay. Stole priest of the temple, and that would have been one of the highest uh, uh, honors that you could have in society, in, in Egyptian society. Uh, and he has a sarcophagus befitting that status. Uh, you can see the detail work is incredible. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, the, um, the wood would have had to come from uh, Lebanon, as they, Egypt did not have a lot of big trees to be able to create something like this. And this is kind of really shows you what it looks like when you take off the, the top portion and the person's inside, That's the mummy's correct. inside. Yeah. And what's interesting is this is only a few hundred years later, but uh, you can see it looks a lot different. It's very dark, and that's a, uh, a tar-like treatment on the outside of both the mummy and the sarcophagus. And that just shows you how even though mummification itself was very similar, uh, a lot of the practices changed over time. Right. But is that a fish? Sorry, now I'm really interested. That's, that's a fish. This is kind of demonstrating that mummification is a process that exists naturally whether or not we use it. And European tourists would come and, and look for a uh, shrunken head to take back with them. Uh, so the practice eventually had to be banned. Originally, it, it was a little bit less gruesome than just a tourist item. It was used as a method of uh, kind of appeasing the soul of someone whom you killed in combat. And then the sloth there is just, uh, you couldn't just go ahead and uh, shrink a human head. You had to practice first to make sure you do it right. And so a sloth was a pretty good way of uh, practicing that. So this is MUMOB. It stands for Mummy at Maryland University, Baltimore. Uh, this was an experimental process done in the 90s. A, uh, a person had donated their body to science, and a team went about trying to reconstruct the method of uh, mummification the Egyptians did. We have a fairly good idea of how they did things, but they took a lot of uh, uh, things for granted, uh, process steps that we would not know today that they took as uh, something that everyone would understand. So they went about trying to find out 
the exact details. Uh, it took 600 pounds of natron salt. They had to figure out what tools to use where and uh, how many days to uh, rest everything. But what we ended up with was the first modern Egyptian mummy. And uh, to all accounts and purposes, it looks as though they did the job correctly. You said 90s. Yep, that 94. No, in 90, so this is very, very recent. Yep, absolutely. It, uh, it's actually the most recent mummy we have on display in the exhibition. This is uh, from the uh, Chinturo uh, civilization, if I remember correctly. And it's a child mummy that was uh, preserved in the high dry climate of South America. And what are these little sticks? So uh, weaving would have been very important to this culture. And oh, so these okay. are uh, for the weaving practices. And in those two rods right there also have some uh, of the uh, cloth on it that are stored that way. Oh. And you can see that they're still uh, brightly colored today. So this is Zwilu woman. She is a peat bog mummy, which is a very rare form of mummy due to the fact that uh, peat bogs are only available in a couple countries throughout the world. Um, so she was found buried in a bog and uh, that unique uh, high acid environment caused the uh, type of mummification that you're seeing here. So this so is from a little town called Vats, Hungary. They were doing a uh, renovation of a church and knocked down a wall and found a crypt with uh, 250 bodies in there that had been mummified naturally because of the uh, conditions in that crypt. Uh, these are the uh, Orlovitz family. It's Michael, Johannes, and uh, Veronica. Uh, they all passed about the same time period. Uh, and poor Veronica had a rough life. You know, she was not only sick for most of her life with tuberculosis, but she passed it on to her family members, including Michael. Uh, who may have uh, been complicated by it. We do know that he had an injury to his leg, uh, but it may be that his immune system was weakened. Uh, we know that also it, it looks like Johannes uh, suffered from tuberculosis, which likely led to his early uh, passing as well. Oh, well that's sad. I was so fortunate to be able to walk through here with Neville, who's able to kind of explain to me each of the different mummification processes and what those people meant to that society. So ex interesting. and. It really does make you feel different kind of ways. I think you need to come and check it out. It'll be here at the St. Louis Science Center through September. So go to the St. Louis Science Center's webpage, check out how you can get tickets and find out more information about that. And after you do that, make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can even drop us a line at the Daily Mix at stltv.net. We want to hear from you. That's going to do it for the Daily Mix. We keep it right here on STL TV and experience St. Louis.